Hey, Echo Church, it's Pastor JD here, and here is another New City Catechism. Today we're on question number six, how can we glorify God? And the answer is, we glorify God by enjoying Him, loving Him, trusting Him, and by obeying His will, commands, and law. So, if you notice, there's they've listed four things here that we can do to glorify God. We enjoy Him. And then loving him, I, I don't see a real strong distinction there between enjoying him and loving him. I think enjoying someone is very much a part of loving someone. So that's true of our human relationships, and that's true of God. Um, loving him is not just obeying, which we're going to see that's part of it in a sec, but it's actually enjoying him, enjoying his presence. So enjoying him, loving him, we could say maybe that's the same thing. But then there's trusting him and by obeying his will, commands, and law. So um, a, a heart that, that wants to glorify God is a heart that says, God, I love, I love you. I, am, uh, I delight in you. I desire to be with you. Um, one of the things we talk about with heaven is that heaven is a place more than any other gift that God gives us in heaven. Uh, his, you know, in perfection and... Uh, free from war and all the things that we talk about heaven being heaven is a place where God is and it's a place where for his people that's what matters most is that he's there and so enjoying him loving him trusting him which is you know we uh, we believe what he says we um, when when uh, we, we believe his word about us and then obeying his will, which I think connects very closely to trusting. So I really think there's kind of two things there. There's the emotional aspect, if you want to call it that, the enjoy, love, the feelings associated with that. Those can't not be there, if that makes sense. They can't not be there. They have to be there as part of a true relationship with God. Just like you can't, you say, well, I'm married, but you know, I don't enjoy my wife. I don't enjoy, I don't love my wife, but I'm married. It that, that 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 doesn't work. It doesn't work here with God either. But so there's the emotion feeling side, but then there's the obedience side. There's the I trust him and therefore I obey him, which by the way, we don't obey a person that we don't trust. So trusting him is is displayed through obedience, as we're gonna see in a minute. So there's some commentary here you guys can read. I would encourage you to do that, but I'm not going to cover that today. I'm just going to quickly look at a couple of verses that talk about, um, you know, just glory. And I want to talk a little bit about what God's glory is. So this is Isaiah 6. It's a familiar uh, passage probably for most of us. Uh, we've covered this together as a church. But I want to talk about what these seraphim... So we're in the throne room of God. Isaiah has been caught up to the throne room itself. And here are these seraphim, and they are saying to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the question is, what does God's holiness in this line have to do with his glory in this line? When we think of God's holiness, the way I understand God's holiness is that it's the sum of all of his character traits. It's the sum of all who God is. So you might ask yourself the question, well, why didn't the angels talk about God's unchangeableness or talk about his, uh, his, his love or his, um, you know, just all of the attributes that we think about when we think of God? Well, it's, they didn't do that because they're saying holy. And holy sums up all of those things. All those things are encapsulated under holy. So holy, okay, but what does glory have to do with it? What does glory have to do with it? Well, look at this. The whole earth is full of his glory. I believe that when that God in himself is holy, if you think of God as maybe the sun, and then shining out from the sun are these rays of brilliant light, right? They're coming out from the sun, which is the source of that light. But then the light expands and it goes out. And when it does, it eventually hits our eye, and we say, oh, what a glorious day, what a beautiful sun, um, you know, how amazing the sun is, I can feel the warmth, I, I know that the sun is causing the tree, you know, the flowers to bloom and the crops to grow and all those things. And we can say, how amazing the sun is. Well, technically, it's the rays from the sun that have hit us. And I know you might think, well, that's a, you know, who cares? That's a silly, des uh, that's a silly thing to, you know, try to try to divide between. But 
I think it I think it actually helps us here understand the difference between, difference between God's holiness and his glory. God's holiness is who God is in himself. It's it's the sun. It's the inside of the sun. We're not at the sun. We're actually uh, we're actually distant from the sun, but God's glory is shining forth and is shining out. And we, though we can't see God in the sense that He is spirit and we He's not visible to our to our eye, we can see His glory and we can actually become part of glorifying Him. So God's glory is when God's holiness goes public. It's when the emanation of God goes forth and others see it and they say, that's glory. That's amazing. But what God is in himself is holiness. Okay, so if I confused you on that, then um, I'll try to explain that better when, you know, when we're, when we come across the text like this. But for now, just let's consider that God's glory is the outshining of God's holiness. And then, so what is it that happens then when uh, when God's creation sees God's glory? So when they see that outshining, what happens? Well, Psalm 19 is a good one. The heavens declare the glory of God. So when we see that glory, okay, and I'm somehow frozen in a weird, hold on, let's, uh, let's get this to where... Okay, excuse me. File. So for some reason, this thing freezes on me often, and I'm not sure why. And then we'll float that on top. Okay, hopefully that works. Uh, we're back. Um, when we see God's glory coming to us like the rays of the sun, we then do something with that. We're called, the heavens here in this verse are called to do something with that. We're called to glorify. We're called to declare, I see it. I see that glory. Okay, and so, um, and then I think other verses, which I just didn't cover here, say that it's not just the heavens. It's not just the stars in the sky. It's actually all of God's creation that was created to glorify him, which is part of our, our question today. So, all of creation, of which we are part of that creation, are called to glorify God. So what does that mean? It means we see the coming of the rays of the sun. The rays hit our eyes. We're able to see the glory of God. <clears throat> and then we're going to say about the glory of God, that's glorious. That's valuable. That is, and it's not just a, I'm going to say it, but I don't feel it, right? Because the beginning of our of our answer, if we go back to our answer, it's that we enjoy him, we love him. Those are both the emotive aspects of a, of our declaration, right? We're we're declaring, but we're saying, God, you are. I feel so. I I just I feel this love. I feel this joy. And. But what? But why? Because something has come to us that we then see and then we then declare. Do you see how the heavens, their job is to declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims. There's a lot of proclamation, declare. It's we say something about it when it hits our, when it hits our eyes, when we see it, when we feel it. Okay. Um, so that's, we're part of creation. Though we're not the heavens in this verse, we are part of the overall creation, which the job of creation is to glorify God. And so then that brings us to another aspect of, so we are to love him, we are to enjoy him, his glory comes and it hits us, his grace comes and it hits us, and we and how do we glorify him? We say, yes, I love it, yes, it's worthy, yes, it's it's valuable. But then there's another way to display that because we can say, yes, I feel all those things. I, I, I experience those emotions, but then life has to be lived out of that. And so here is Jesus saying, okay, if, so let me piece this all together. God's glory comes. We are to express that glory. We are to speak about that glory. We are to not just speak about it. We are to feel that glory, the, the weight of that, and the love that we have for him. And then Jesus comes along and says, John 14, 15, if you love me, okay, God, I love you. I, I'm singing of your praises. I am seeing, I can see your glory and it's amazing. It's so good. He says, okay, if you love me, 
you will keep my commandments. Well, now it's getting real because we can say we love, but how we live actually displays more than even the declaration. Now, it doesn't mean that the declaration, that the speaking about God is that it goes away, but it means that the way we live lines up with our speaking and it, and it means that, okay, what I say and what I live are the same. And so it's impossible to say you love God and yet you don't keep his commandments. Now, does that mean perfection? No, I want to make sure I'm always clear that we're, we're imperfect beings. However, there's a life of repentance. There's a life of wanting to fight sin. There's a life of wanting to do what's obedient to the Lord, what he calls us to do, that is consistent with a life which says, I love him. And all of that, the love, the obedience, the trust, all of that glorifies him. And that's actually what we're called to do as his beings is to glorify him. So I hope this was helpful to you and we will see you guys next week with another new city catechism.